So a couple months ago, I used YouTube's post feature to announce by way of a screen cap, because it, it, it had to be a screen cap, because the announcement was behind a paywall, that I sold a novel uh, to commercial fiction publisher St. Martin's Press, uh, Axioms and a Stranger Things Meets Arrival story set in an alternate 2000s about a young woman who becomes the sole point of communication between humanity and a hostile alien civilization. Okay, and so for you smartasses who are bagging on this, I did not write this. I honestly don't know where they got Stranger Things. Uh, doesn't take place in the 80s. It's not even like, you know, magical metaphysical stuff. Is it on brand? Yes. Is it too long? Probably. Can I pre-order it? Actually, you can. <laughs> they got right on the ball. And I know what you're thinking, like, oh, another one of those, you know. Here I have been slaving away at the great American novel for decades, and another one of these YouTubers just has a book deal, like, foisted upon them. The influencers sit recumbent on the chaise lounge and receive the offers. When in reality, I have been working at this for 10 fucking years. Well, no, I don't mean literally the same book for 10 years. It did not take me 10 years to write this. Well, I mean, sort of. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. And the truth is, yes, it is a lot easier for some people with bigger platforms to get book deals than others, but that also depends on the type of book that they are writing. In the case of YouTubers and influencers, what publishers usually want is like, you know, My Life is a Girl Boss, the book, or Hi, I'm an Instagram Model, the book. But I was like, no, I like suffering. I want to write novels, better yet, of the science fiction variety. You know, science fiction, that, that biggest piece of the publishing pie. Everybody loves it, so in demand. It's not. So today I'm doing something a little different in discussing how does one actually go about publishing a novel. I'm going to demystify the process. Because I know a lot of people that subscribe to this channel are either creatives or aspiring creatives themselves. You need to know what holy hell you're getting into and decide, mm, can I handle that many rejection letters? So how it works. If it's your first time, fiction and nonfiction are handled generally quite differently. Nonfiction is generally sold on proposal, meaning there will be between one and three chapters of the book written. And also you'll have like a bio and then like some stuff about your platform and an outline of the book and, you know, a section saying why I am the expert that should be writing this book. And with fiction, again, for debut authors that aren't famous, it needs to be done. The book needs to be 100% written. Debut novels are very, very rarely sold on proposal. Outliers to the point of should not be counted. Yes, I know it happens, but it doesn't happen very often. I mean, a debut novel might be sold on proposal if it's by like a celebrity or, you know, it's like a YA adventure about like, beating the system written by a YouTuber with more than 10 million subs, but you know, if that's the case, they're probably hiring a ghostwriter anyway. I am I am obsessed with this shirt I got, by the by, at the Pantages the other day. The Cats trailer has sent me spiraling into a severe Andrew Lloyd Webber relapse this fall. Anyway, yes, there are famous people exceptions, but in general, debut novels are not sold on proposal. It needs to be done, and by done, I mean it needs to be edited, it needs to be polished, it needs to have gone through several drafts, and by the time you think you are ready to go, you are wrong. Put that thing back in the drawer, take it around the block a few more times, it still needs work. Trust me. You have to be able to look at this thing and go, yes, I could see this going to print tomorrow. This is the level that we're at. The thing about writing, especially something as like sprawling as a novel, is that writers are actually not very good at judging the merits of their own work. Shock, I know. When the truth is, nine times out of 10, authors think they are ready to go before they are ready to go. I know I was. We'll get to that. But now that you have written the thing, it is time for step two, get a literary agent. Arguably the hardest step, because this is the part in which the odds are least in your favor. So you've submitted your query, you are now in the slush pile, which is a very uncharitable name for unsolicited material, because most of it is detritus. Like, Yes, there was a time when authors submitted directly to publishers and they did not need a literary agent. We call those times the 1970s. Yes, there are some exceptions, but for your purposes, if you want to get published with a major publisher and most small presses and a huge 
chunk of indie presses too, you need a literary agent. They won't even look at you if you don't have one. And while we are here, no, you do not pay your literary agent before you sell your book. They take a cut after they sell your book. If there is an agent saying that you need to pay them up front, they're not an agent, they're lying. It's a scam, run away. So what does a literary agent do? Are they anything other than a glorified filter that exists to separate the rabble from the publisher so the publisher doesn't have to waste their precious time and resources anymore? Well... See, here's the thing. You are a special flower, an artiste floating along on the winds of inspiration. You don't understand contracts. <laughs> The publishing industry is labyrinthine and complicated, and it has a culture that you do not understand. I know I don't. On top of that, contracts have gotten a lot more complicated since the 1970s. Mine, for instance, was pretty boilerplate, and it still took two months between selling the book and signing the thing. That was a pretty quick turnaround. On top of that, agents also negotiate royalty rates and advances for you and also advise on what you should ask for in your contract because they know what is standard and what is reasonable to ask for and you don't. But there is a creative element too. A lot of literary agents will actually do a pass, do some edits with you before you actually go on submission to publishers. They also act as sort of a go-between between you and the publisher, you know, so they can like soak up the emotions if you have too many, because it turns out you're not supposed to yell at your publisher. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never So why are the odds not in your favor at this stage? Well, it's because of volume. It's hard to find exact stats on this, how many submissions any given literary agent gets per day. My agent gets between 15 and 20 per day. So depending on the size of the agency, a literary agent is going to get anywhere from several hundred to several thousand queries per year. And depending on how much they are trying to build their list, they may only take on half a dozen or less. So I'm not saying you have less than one in a thousand odds for your basic mid-list literary agent. Actually, I am saying that. That brings us to step 2.5, the query letter. <sighs> okay, so if you're a novelist, you're probably not very good at being concise. But the query letter is basically a two paragraph, less than 250 word pitch. It's basically the copy you would read on the back of the book. It is designed to make the person reading it be like, oh yeah, I wanna throw down my 2795 MSRP for that. It's not a summary. You should not summarize, it is a pitch. And it's actually really hard to do well. A bard, a mage, and a rogue meet in a tavern and then they hear of a quest. There's a business centaur that owns a company and he's just, he's living his life until one day a plucky young virgin becomes his secretary or something. And then, oh, the pa I'm yeah, see, I'm really good at that. So each literary agency operates differently, but in general, the steps will be query letter leads to partial request, which means part of your manuscript, like the first five chapters or something. They like that, then they'll ask for the whole manuscript. And if they like that, then they will offer you representation. Generally, this process will be protracted over several months. Unless you're just that amazing, sometimes it can be really fast, but usually it's not. Wow, you have an agent now. Good for her. Hopefully your agent will help you out on the creative front too, because presumably they took on your project, not just because they thought they could sell it, but you know, because they like it. And the level to which they will help you before you go on submission to publishers varies a lot. Like it could be just like an email with like, hey, maybe you should like brush this up or like, you know, you use the word basically too much. Or they could do like an entire line edit through your manuscripts. Depends on the agent. Next stop book deal? Well, not so fast. First, we got to talk about who we are submitting to. Generally, an agent will want to start with big five publishers because they are the ones with the money and they are the ones with the best marketing and the widest distribution. So what do I mean when I say big five? Well, basically they're the biggest five, but also they are umbrella corporations effectively for many, many, many publishers. The big five are Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, Hachette, uh, uh, oh, Macmillan, which is mine, and HarperCollins. The way it works is at the top we have the publishing house, then you have the publisher, then you have the imprint. And the imprint is where the editor works. They are the one that specialize in whatever it is you are trying to sell. For instance, my imprint is St. Martin's Press, which is an imprint of St. Martin's Press 
uh, which is owned by Macmillan. Imprints specialize in different things. So for instance, you'll have Tor Forge, which specializes in sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, Love Swept will be HarperCollins. Is it HarperCollins? No, it's Random House. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a romance imprint. St. Martin's Press specializes in commercial fiction, which obviously can mean uh, genre fiction, but you know, a certain type. Let's just say I was rejected from more than one uh, genre imprint for not being sci-fi enough. It's a rival meets stranger thing. So big five publishers are desirable not just because they are able to pay advances, sometimes very big ones, but also because they have much wider distribution. Generally, you'll go on a round of submission. You'll see how that goes. Maybe it'll sell on the first round, but if it doesn't, you probably want to do some revisions before you go on round two. And then when you go on round two and it doesn't sell then, then maybe you want to start seriously considering smaller presses or indie presses or self-publishing or trunking it. And we'll get to that. Okay, so let's say you are on submission. If there is more than one offer, then it goes to auction. And auctions are great, they make you feel really popular. But most of the time for debut authors, especially if they don't have a big platform, this process will be protracted over a period of several months. So, while on the one hand there are an ever-increasing number of options to get your book out there, traditional publishing is actually more competitive than it has ever, ever been. Yeah, especially for fiction. And that leads us to my monstrosity. 10 years, huh? 10 years that seems like sad. Like, eh, here's where I get there is this expectation when you work in a new media that people think that you're gonna be like, you know what, I'm bucking the system. Screw you gatekeepers, I gotta do me. <laughs> But uh, no, no, that is not what I wanted to do. So this is a story about traditional publishing and rejection and all sorts of fun things and why I never talked about it till now. So let's get this out of the way first. There's this sort of wrong-ish idea I see floating around that if you have a platform of, you know, decently sized, that you're pretty much guaranteed a book deal. And, uh, you know, wow, you know, that's not true. And, and I will find that people that even work in the industry are surprised that, like, my platform didn't get me something much sooner. Which inevitably leads to these dipshits on Reddit surmising that, like, well, if you can't get a book deal despite those YouTube subs, well, oof. Which just kind of reveals that these people don't know how anything works. And that's fine. That's why I'm here. Fundamentally, quality is secondary to where the market is and what they think they can sell. Especially for fiction, a thing no one should write. Okay, so what did I mean by that? When I said this whole big nonsense thing took 10 years, what I mean is it was about 10 years between my conscious decision of, yes, I am going to pursue this thing, by this thing I mean traditional publishing with a big five publisher, and it actually happening. <laughs> was the novel I sold the first novel I wrote? No. <laughs> I'd argue that it wasn't even the second, but it was also kind of the first. I said so it was the first and well, anyway. So I joke a lot about fanfic, but the truth is fanfic is actually really good practice and a good way to decide if that is something that you wanna pursue. And I joke about it a lot, especially with the phantom stuff, but the truth is I was not terribly prolific until I was in college because I had this uh, narrative about myself that, uh, you know, I just don't finish things. I'm just, I just, I don't have the attention span. Too bad for me. I guess I'm just gonna work in data collection for the rest of my life because I'm 22 and I don't know anything. But then, thanks to the wonderful world of fan fiction, I actually did start finishing some stuff. You know, it wasn't good, <laughs> but I finished it. So again, this was around the time that the, you know, economy crashed and I went to grad school. So going into film and television, of course, that's where we're going to start making serious attempts. <laughs> because after all, there was no way in hell I was going to go into a creative writing MFA on the strength of a few overlong fanfics. No, going into debt at one of the most expensive film schools in the world during the worst recession in living memory is a much better idea. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're at film school, it's 2009, part of the curriculum is let's uh, come up with some story ideas. There's a class called Ideation. <laughs> we, uh, we have fun. So the first non-fanfic thing I wrote was this sad sack attempt at uh, 
Christian romance novel because I knew someone who worked at the Harlequin imprint for Christian romance called Love Inspired. And this imprint was one of the only imprints that was taking unagented authors. And I, in my infinite hubris, was like, anyone can do that. <laughs> At least I got some practice in. I did also write a full length screenplay while I was at USC for a class. No, it will never see the light of day because it was quite bad. But then I got an idea in 2010 that was rooted in some items that were in the news at the time. Well, how, how about that, but with aliens? But no, I did not start writing it then. That did not happen until 2013. And I wrote the first draft in two months. It was one twilight long because i measure everything in units of twilight this is a twilight <laughs> this book actually has really big print it's not that it's not that long that first draft was described by one person that i no longer speak to at the time as publishable <laughs> which is probably a little bit of a red flag when the people in your life don't really have the heart to tell you that your word baby is a bit of a yike but I, in my infinite arrogance, was like, we're off to the races. I very wrongly assumed that my platform, which was much smaller than it is now, would make me a catch. <laughs> so even if the book wasn't all that great and sure as hell was not ready, it didn't matter. They'd help me fix it. I've got 20,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> I think I might have done like one very minor revision before I sent it to um, actually, like not very many agents. I only think I, I only sent it to a few and one of whom I knew personally 5,000 words to very nicely say yikes Which was good because it finally brought me down to reality and realized that like oh, I actually maybe should uh, Take this a little more seriously So I spent a few months on revisions and now armed with you know a little bit of perspective uh, We tried round two this time. I actually queried pretty widely. I got interest from about 30% of the agents I queried, and then actually it happened rather quickly. I got an offer of representation after about two, three months, and then I had an agent. We did it. I hopped the hardest turtle, right? So what now? Well, we revise it again, substantially, before we go on submission. Submission round one, mostly big five and a couple of smaller publishers like Quirk Books. Generally, a round of submission will be between maybe 10 and 15 editors. And uh, wow, that was a lot of rejection. <laughs> like I got rejected so hard, I don't think I got like a detailed rejection letter from anyone. And that whole rigmarole from start to final no thank was about four months. So uh, yeah, so what now? Well, we revise again, let's try to figure out what was wrong. Another round of submissions. This time, it was, I think, a few more, maybe 15. And this time, well, I got one or two rejections that were quite detailed. <laughs> See, progress. One or two felt it wasn't commercial enough. The guy at HarperCollins thought I was whip smart. But most people just didn't connect with the voice, which is, of course, industry to speak for. I think you're a shitty writer. And here we are at the end of 2014, Two years of work and nothing to show for it. What now? You can go downstream to smaller presses, which, you know, might give you less money up front, but will still distribute as widely as any of the larger ones. Or you can go indie, or you can self-publish. I mean, that kind of makes sense. If you have a platform already, self-publishing does mean you get to keep a much bigger cut of the money that comes in for you. But there is a third option. We got us. A trunk novel. The trunk novel. Everyone has one. They don't. So yeah, I could have self-published. Even now I get a lot of people asking me why I didn't because like, you know, hey, there's no shame in it. And also you'd make a lot more money with your platform. And well, okay, first of all, I don't know about that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to disagree with you there, Bard. And secondly, I did not want to self-publish. Like, I'd self-publish right here. Like, this is what I'm doing. That's what YouTube is. All I do is self-publish. But ultimately, the reason that I trunked it was because I felt that the reason it wasn't selling wasn't because the market was necessarily hostile to that sort of thing, which it totally was, but 
because it wasn't ready. And by extension, I was not ready. I had not put in the work. I had not done the hours. And there are many people who would call this flawed thinking. After all, publishing is very fickle and they always play it safe. And most of the time, whenever you get a no from an agent or a publisher, it isn't because they don't like it. It's because they don't think they can sell it. They don't think it will move copies. Yeah, after my book comes out, we will we can talk about the, the, the why <laughs> it was a hard sell. Uh, but the TLDR is it doesn't really fit with any kind of publishing trends right now. That's it. That, oh wow, that was actually simple. But at the end of the day, in my heart of hearts, I knew Trunk Novel had major problems. Like, you know, there were definitely some contrivances. Some of it was really half-assed. It read like a debut novel, which it was. So I put the book away. The book has been trunked. Time to move on. Round two, 2015, 2016. We have moved on completely. I get an idea for a new novel wholly unrelated to the first one, same genre, doesn't have aliens in it. <laughs> I very naively thought that this one would be more commercial, despite the fact that it was still genre fiction, a thing that no one should ever write. I very naively gave it the working title, commercial as fuck, <laughs> because I thought it would be. So I broke up with the first literary agent, No Hard Feelings, because surely I will have no problem getting a literary agent that is more, I don't know, suited to what I'm going for. I'm me. <laughs> huh. Looks like the lighting and setup has slightly changed. It's not totally because I filmed this on a different day. I still have two copies of John Scalzi's The Consuming Fire, though. This one says happy birthday. So I start writing commercial as fuck over late 2016, early 2017, and then I start querying commercial as fuck around mid-2017, and this one gets even less interest than the last time. Fucking really? This is supposed to be commercial as fuck. So yeah, I got a bunch of partial requests and a bunch of full requests, but ultimately no offers, asterisk. And a lot of the times it would get rejected for reasons that would be like totally fixable, like, you know, location or something. And it would be like, oh, well, I could revise that. If you, okay. And while we are here, the truth is these days, if your book needs a lot of revision or even not that much revision, agents probably aren't going to be interested in walking you through it. Although it does depend on the agent, your mileage may vary. But I did find one agent that was willing to work with it and was really interested in fixing it. You know, like the characters, like the premise, but the ending is a little too bleak. And I'm like, look, it's 2017. My heroes are dead and my enemies are in power. What do you want? But point taken. So she is willing to talk representation if I am able to revise the thing in a way that she thinks can sell. But the problem is, I don't really know how I want to revise it. This is just where I'm at. So despite the extensive feedback that this agent gives me, I sit on this thing for many months, not quite knowing how to fix it. But it is at this point in early 2018, a full three years after our trunk novel has been trunked, that I go ahead and dig that one out, maybe thinking that will inspire me. And it is at this point that I remember what interested me so much in that story in the first place. But it is also at this point that the problems that had been plaguing the thing basically since its inception become wildly obvious to me. Why is it so expository in the first five chapters? Why is the entire third act like that? Why did I not do a motivation better? And so Trunk Novel is where my inspiration goes, not commercial as fuck, so I start working on that instead. And what was supposed to be a fairly modest rewrite with the intention of, I guess, you know, getting the creative juices flowing for the other one ends up being like a complete overhaul. And by the end of this rewrite, I have deleted about 60,000 words and written another 70,000. And so by the time I'm done with this, and this would have been about a month after the Hobbit videos came out, I was like, hey, look, a thing. I guess I have two projects again, sort of. And as far as I can see, Trunk Novel is the more polished of the two. So why don't we just tepidly see if there's any interest there? So once again, I very tepidly send out like, I don't know, maybe 10 query letters and nose across the board. Okay, fine. This is clearly not meant to be fine. And the flavors of the no are pretty much all variations on, mm, I don't think I can sell that. But here's the thing, that revision actually did do the thing it was intended to do, and it helped me figure out how I wanted to fix the bleak ending of commercial as fuck. So you know what, working on Trunk Novel wasn't a total wash. So I'm working on that, and then I get an email from this agent telling me that she is leaving the agenting industry. Jesus Christ. All right, fine. Fine, I give up. I give up. The end. Oh wait, no, this is about 
like triumph or something. <sighs> Never give up, except for I totally gave up. And this is where my hashtag privilege comes in. So it was almost around this exact time that this rando in Brooklyn emails me like, hey, I'm a literary agent, do you have one? <laughs> and this was not the only thing that was going on in my life. Like if you watch the talk I did for XOXO 2019, which is on their YouTube channel, this was around that time. So, you know, my heroes are dead, my enemies are in power. Not a great time. So he asked me if I have anything that I'd be willing to share, and I'm like, okay, which one do you want? Do you want commercial as fuck, or do you want trunk novel? And he says, whichever one is more done. So, trunk novel it is. So basically, in very short order, he does pinpoint the issue with why agents thought that they could not sell this. And one of these days I might talk about the issue. <laughs> and no, it wasn't about like problematic content or gender or anything, but it was very small and ultimately very fixable. It was kind of on the level of like, hey, this takes place in Santa Monica. What if it took place in San Diego instead? <laughs> We'll talk about it one day. So this dude, his name is Christopher Hermlin, and he is part of a boutique agency in Brooklyn. He signs me up, we do a round or two of revisions, and then we go on submission the first week of January. That was on a Monday. I get my first phone call from an editor on a Friday, and then after talking to a few more, ultimately it's sold in less than two weeks. Yep. Okay, so ultimately we come again full circle with that question of why is my thing not selling? What is wrong with my manuscript? Is it my manuscript that's the problem or the market? And in my case it's a little difficult to answer since I ultimately did sell to a commercial imprint and the book itself doesn't really fall in line with any publishing trends right now. So it does kind of remain to be seen just how much, if at all, St. Martin's gamble will pay off because that is kind of the reason that agents are so bearish and they want things that are comparable to things that have already sold well. This, for the record, was mine. Thank you, Hank, for debuting at number one. Readers are creatures of habit. They want things that are like the thing that they've already read. So if I'm to come to a publisher with this book and they're like, okay, what is it about? And I'm like, I don't know, it's Independence Day meets the big short. Mary Doria Russell's Invader Zim. <laughs> I guess it's kind of fair for them to be like, I don't really care if it's any good or not, I don't know if I can sell that. The point here being is that it is honestly really difficult to tell where the line in the sand is, your work is not good enough, and the publisher slash agent doesn't think there is a market for it. <sighs> so in conclusion, something something, follow your dreams. I think it would have been just as easy for me to be like, yeah, I wrote a thing and it's out now, uh, and then not you know, cop to the 10 years of, I guess failure is a strong word, struggle. And then people will be like, wow, I guess you just magically did it on the first try, when in reality, no. <laughs> because it doesn't do anyone any favors to act like, even in a position like mine, where I have a relatively large online platform, I didn't have to put in the work and go through a lot of rejection. But here is what I have learned from the thing. Learning to write, learning to be a novelist, and the publishing industry in general is incredibly, incredibly slow going. So you have to be incredibly patient. And looking back, the best choice I made in the whole thing was choosing to trunk that novel in 2014. So the fact that I was able to get in another five years of writing experience actually helped the thing get to a level where it could sell to a major publisher and hopefully will be, you know, not hated by a plurality of you. So in some ways I think fiction is more difficult to publish than nonfiction because it's harder to really gauge demand for but that is not to say that nonfiction is easier. <laughs> it's just different. But a lot of people's success really is owed to luck and timing. These people that you hear of that get these like debut novels with six figure advances and you know, they tend to be YA. Um, they hit at the right point in the right genre, but they also tend to be outliers. For instance, if you were querying a YA dystopia in 2009, you're probably going to get different results from querying the same book in 2019. A few years ago, author Jim C. Hines did a survey of traditionally published authors to see how long it actually took them to get published, and the average length of time was, drumroll, 11 years. So what does that mean for this channel? Is this going to turn into the shameless self-promotion channel? Well, no. Not yet. I mean, six months it will. <laughs> but I do imagine that this has shed some light on uh, 
why this channel hasn't been as prolific as it has been in years past. And one more thing with regard to pre-orders, and this applies to pretty much all traditionally published authors, is if you want to support an author and you plan on buying the book anyway, pre-orders are a great way to do that because it helps the publisher decide where they are going to end up, you know, spending their resources, who gets the marketing, who gets to go on a book tour. Pre-orders are basically their barometer to, you know, who gives a shit. So if you want to pre-order American Three-Body Problem for Girls, the link is in the description. It is available in hardcover and Kindle right now. I guess the paperback will be like, I don't know, six months or a year after that. And yeah, this won't be the last video of this kind. I will probably be doing a lot more process slash publishing industry type stuff in the months and years to come. Although yes, don't worry, we will still be doing traditional video essay type stuff too. So, so yeah, so yeah, I know everybody can't wait for this YouTuber book. This should be, this should be an interesting journey that we can all go on together. Hope this was some help, and if it wasn't, well, hope at least it was entertaining to watch. This is gonna be a long year. Happy end of the decade, everybody.